Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar, Digitizing Drama, the story of the online platform Cambridge Shakespeare. My name is Leah Hines. I'm the executive director of the Charleston Conference, and I'm joined today by two people from Cambridge University Press, Emily Hockley, commissioning editor, and Rachel Brook, marketing executive. I'm really happy to have both of you with me, uh, Rachel and Emily. Thanks for being here. Um, before we get started with today's webinar, I have a few announcements. Um, for our technology, we're using uh, the Zoom platform, which most of you should be familiar with. Um, maybe you've done a webinar with us before, uh, but just in case, we're going to go through a few of the options here. Uh, the best audio quality is going to be if you connect with your computer speakers instead of trying to go through uh, telephone audio. Uh, if you have some issues, though, there is an option to connect by phone. Um, there's an option to raise and lower your hand. You can see at the bottom of the screen, uh, you can click the raise hand icon if you have an issue or a question. But sometimes the best method, um, if you've got a technical issue or a question is to use the attendee chat. You can click there. Um, you can click direct to me or to the presenters and we'll get with you as soon as possible. We're gonna hold questions for our presenters till the end of the session. You can click the Q&A button and you'll have a little pop-up screen. You can input questions and comments here and we'll hold those until the end. Um, and Rachel and Emily will get to as many of those as we can when the session is over. Um, but if, if you have a question that comes to mind during the presentation, feel free to use that um, and submit the question while it's on your mind and we'll hold those till the end. Uh, there's original size and full screen options at the top as well if you need to make the screen larger or smaller, um, just standard um, issues there. But we're going to uh, share Rachel and Emily's slides now. Um, they're going to take over. I um, look forward to hearing from you and I'll come back when it's time for Q&A. Thank you very much. Okay, I, hi, this is Rachel. Um, you should all be able to see my screen, I believe. So I will get started. Thank you very much for, for calling in. Um, as Leah said, we will be talking about the story of the online platform Cambridge Shakespeare, which is a, a new and forthcoming platform from Cambridge University Press. Uh, I'm Rachel, uh, Rachel Brook, executive at Cambridge University Press, and uh, I'll be giving you a brief sort of contextualizing history of Cambridge's history of publishing Shakespeare before handing over to my colleague Emily, who will talk uh, detail about the history of this particular platform and how it's been developed. So to get into the, the kind of history behind this, um, Shakespeare was actually born just 30 years after Cambridge University Press was founded, but it wasn't for another three years that we started to print his works. Uh, since then, Cambridge has been publishing his plays and poetry pretty much continuously in a, a really wide variety of forms. Uh, so this all started in 1863, uh, and this before the Cambridge University Press actually edited any of Shakespeare's works, we printed a nine volume edition for Macmillan, a, a different publisher. Uh, that, this uh, was a big project, as you can imagine, nine volumes, the complete works of Shakespeare, so it was, wasn't actually finished until 1866, a few years later. And that same year, there was also a single edition published called the Globe Edition, again for Macmillan. By this time, Shakespeare was already a, a popular author on school syllabuses. So in the 1890s, the press launched the Pitt Press Shakespeare for schools series. And this was a series of single volume editions of the plays. And then going into the 20th century, in 1921, the press started to publish our first scholarly editions of Shakespeare, starting with The Tempest. And again, this was a kind of behemoth project. It ended up taking over 40 years to publish editions of every play. One of the initial editors dropped out quite soon when he realised how much work it was going to be. And his co-editor, John Dover Wilson, eventually lost his eyesight due to the amount of hours that he put in working on this project. So by 1966, there were new Shakespeare editions of, of every play. During the Second World, War, Second World War in 1940, 
we actually had a few, a couple of these texts go completely out of print uh, due to a warehouse being destroyed during the Blitz air raids. 1948, just a few years later, this was the first publication of Shakespeare's Survey, an annual yearbook of Shakespeare's studies, which aims to appeal to scholars, theatre workers and archivists, and is still publishing today. In 1957, uh, the press was involved with producing our first audio versions of Shakespeare's plays. Um, and this was the Dover Wilson editions of the text, licensed to Argo, who produced audio versions on LP. The performances were brought to life by actors from the university's Marlowe Dramatic Society, alongside professional actors. In 1968, Dover Wilson's texts appeared in another form again, this time paperback editions that were illustrated with Picasso's iconic take on Shakespeare. These became known as the Picasso Shakespeare. By the late 1970s, these Dover Wilson editions were really starting to show their age. So the press began to work on newly edited versions with supporting notes and published these from 1984. These were decorated with a David Hockney design that referenced the Picasso Shakespeare. So you can see on your screens the two similar style Shakespeare head icons. In the 1990s, uh, we launched the Shakespeare in Production series, which pretty much does what it says on the tin. It provides comprehensive notes on production and performance history alongside the play texts. Then in the early 2000s, the audio performances returned in, in new form, graduating from LP to cassette and then ultimately to CD. And the performances feature high profile actors, including Kenneth Branagh. So really, as a new decade looms with 2020 on the horizon, it's kind of perfect timing for Cambridge Shakespeare to embrace another format. Uh, so we now go online with Cambridge Shakespeare and I'll hand over to Emily to tell you more about it. Thank you. Hi, so I'm Emily Hockley, Commissioning Editor for Theatre and Literature um, at Cambridge University Press. Um, I'm the editorial representative of the Cambridge Shakespeare digital platform um, and have been since 2017. So the, the process of um, defining and building the product actually started quite a long time before my arrival at the press, so I can't take credit for those stages. Um, but I'm enormously proud of where we've got to um, and the fact that the platform is, is now available for trialling. Uh, as I, I hope Rachel's historical tour has made clear, the platform is just the latest stage in the long continuum of uh, Cambridge Shakespeare publishing um, and our experiments with different formats over many years. So I'll give a quick summary of the component parts of the platform to start off um, before digging into the thinking, development and challenges that went on behind the scenes in bringing them together um, into something which is dynamic and integrated. Um, and then at the end, uh, time permitting, I'll give you a quick demo of the site itself. Um, so thinking about the component parts of the platform, um, we have at the centre of it um, the new Cambridge Shakespeare, um, which is a best-selling um, series of play texts aimed at undergraduates. Um, we have 41 volumes with lively introductions, glosses, commentary notes and textual notes. Um, the series started in 1984, um, but we've continued to, um, to revise them with new introductions and new commentary notes um, suited to contemporary students. Um, and as, as Rachel's journey through the history of CUP uh, has shown, the new uh, in the title re references the Cambridge Shakespeare, um, which was really groundbreaking in its time in the 19th century and also shows um, quite what a long lineage uh, major Shakespearean publishing endeavours have. Uh, the other major component of the platform is the Cambridge Guide to the Worlds of Shakespeare. Um, so this is down at the, the bottom of the screen. Um, it's a gigantic reference resource um, and it aims to replicate really the expansive reach of Shakespeare's global reputation. 
It's transhistorical, international and interdisciplinary. And in the print editions, volume one looks at the world in which Shakespeare and his contemporaries lived. Um, and volume two examines what the world has made of Shakespeare as a cultural icon over the past four centuries. Um, we then also have 14 editions of uh, Shakespeare in production. Um, so this is a series of, of um, texts which provide an introduction charting the stage history um, of each particular play um, and also provide detailed commentary notes throughout illuminating the text um, and really, really bringing it to life by showing the performance history um, of, of the text. Uh, incredibly helpful to literature students. Um, I remember using them myself as an undergraduate um, as it really helps them to, to think about the interpretive possibilities of production. So not just seeing it as a static text, um, but something which has been interpreted in multiple different ways. Uh, so for example, if, if you look at uh, the Hamlet Shakespeare in production, there's an incredibly detailed note on Hamlet's speech in Act 1, Scene 3. Um, and it, it basically details um, how possibly the most famous line in all of world drama um, has been reinterpreted by different actors. Um, so partly <laughs> uh, to bring a new interpretation to the text and partly to discourage the audience from reciting to be or not to be, that is the question along with the actor. Um, various actors have, have reinterpreted uh, it by thinking about running on stage, uh, speaking in excitement, uh, speaking softly to rather despairingly and ominously holding an unsheathed sword. Um, then we also have the seven editions from the early Quarto series. Um, so these editions are really indispensable to advanced students of Shakespeare and of textual bibliography. They have a, a strong focus on the, on the textual um, study of Shakespeare. Um, we also have Emma Smith's uh, The Cambridge Shakespeare Guide, um, which is a fantastic introductory student guide and is perfect for those just starting out studying Shakespeare. Um, we had one rather optimistic reviewer call it probably the only guide you will ever need to Shakespeare and his plays, which is obviously a bit of a stretch from my point of view as a Shakespeare publisher, um, but you get the sort of idea. Uh, we then also have around 150 items of image uh, image-based audio and video content, which has been specially curated for us by the, the Folger Shakespeare Library. So the vast majority of these resources have only been available in print um, or individual ebook form up until now. Um, they've really existed as standalone products. As will be clear from uh, the following history, which we'll dig into, one of the main opportunities of the digital platform has, has offered um, has been that of careful integration. So rather than just making an archive of our wonderful component parts, um, we've taken the opportunity to add, uh, to add really substantial value to the component parts through creating valuable pathways through them. Uh, the integration of different types and forms of content also has its own challenges, uh, more of which later. So, um, oh, sorry. Uh, to set the scene, um, back in 2010, uh, the Cambridge Shakespeare and Early Modern List as a whole was in a, a really strong position uh, in terms of its print offering. As is true today, no other publisher had the breadth, depth, range and consistently high quality um, of our Shakespeare and Early Modern List. Ambitious digital experimentation was also occurring in specific pockets of our dramatic publishing, um, but the list's revenue was almost entirely based on its print offering. Large swathes of it were only available in print form. Uh, we had a, a radical experiment in digital publishing at that time, um, which was underway with um, the digital version of the complete works of Ben Johnson. But the responsibility of building that site lay with our partner um, in the project, which was King's College London. And so as a result, we weren't involved in the actual nitty gritty digital creation, correction or enhancement of the site. And we hadn't, uh, crucially hadn't acquired that digital experience in house. Um, so turning to Shakespeare, we had to learn that for ourselves. Um, 
An online version of the new Cambridge Shakespeare texts was in particular an obvious and, and had been a really long planned aim. Um, because as students had access to a number of free online versions of the texts, many weren't reliable um, and none certainly featured the extensive but student-friendly annotations and introductions that our texts provide. It was also an excellent moment uh, to think about what we would offer beyond the texts and the commentary, um, especially as no other publisher had yet managed to launch a comprehensive Shakespeare site for students and researchers. So we were in a position where we knew we wanted a product that would integrate reliable, annotated, dramatic and poetic texts linked to authoritative commentary and beyond that a database of critical material, um, but how we would get there uh, would have to be worked out. Um, so to give you, give you a bit more of a sense of the, of the thinking and the strategizing behind the platform, um, the project was really given impetus and direction um, when plans for the, the huge reference resource, the worlds of Shakespeare, uh, crystallised. So this was really the, the beginning of an iterative process, which was informed by a great deal of canvassing and market research um, amongst our potential audience. Um, so here on this slide, we've got a breakdown of, of the major component parts of um, the worlds of Shakespeare. I hope this gives you uh, a sense of, of the breadth that it offers. Um, its, its strengths, while it was being worked on, we, we knew um, would lie in the, the scope of the contextual material it would offer to readers. Um, at over 2 million words with over 300 contributors from five continents, covering just about every conceivable form of Shakespearean context, it would be vast. Published in two massive volumes, it would offer a huge span of topics. So just to give you a sense of that, um, it would cover Renaissance theatrical costumes, Shakespeare's fellow playwrights, performance history in Japan, films of Shakespeare's plays, early modern rhetoric, Judaism in the early modern world. Uh, I could go on and on. The architecture of the book, which you can see here, um, it's divided into 30 sections and each, 30, each of those 30 sections is composed um, of a long macro essay, uh, which is then followed by around 10 micro essays. Um, and we felt that this format would work really well in print, um, but needed a huge amount uh, more content and functionality in order to become a coherent and substantial digital product. So um, we therefore decided not to create uh, just a, a straightforward online replica of the print edition, um, but rather wanted to think about how we could integrate it with other content. Um, added to that, context alone clearly doesn't make a resource the natural port of call for students or scholars. Um, for example, if you want to know about Shakespeare and Islam, you can find an excellent essay for it in the world, uh, but sooner or later you'll want to check against the playtext itself. Um, and without that text, um, students would clearly leave the site and find it elsewhere um, and, and we'll use them. So uh, we would clearly need to incorporate the play texts, but how? Um, so as you know, uh, or hopefully you know, <laughs> uh, different editions of Shakespeare exhibit different editors' textual choices. Um, so our, our series New Cambridge Shakespeare and our series Shakespeare in Production very handily for us use exactly the same texts. Um, so this gave us a great opportunity to integrate their surrounding apparatus. Um, so we would offer a main reading text which has both the commentary um, and the textual notes from the NCS um, and then also uh, integrate the production notes from Shakespeare in Production offering the three different types of notes that you can see here. So we've got variance, commentary and performance. Um, which can also be turned on and off by the user depending on what their particular interests are. Um, and integrating these three types of notes into one edition had obviously never been possible um, in inexpensive print editions for students just because of the vast number of pages it would produce. Um, 
It's also clear from the market research that we conducted that we'd need a really high level of hyperlinking um, to make the reader's task of cross-referencing both between different plays um, referenced in the notes um, within plays, so from one scene to another um, referenced in the print text, um, and also between plays and related reference material. Um, so this is a, a slide of our, our homepage. Um, our market research also uh, helped to reveal that instructors often don't like resources that direct students down um, rigid predetermined paths. Um, at the same time, clearly a major part of our role as a publisher is to curate content for uh, our audience so it's easily navigable. Um, so to, to solve this, we um, conceived of two major broad pathways through the site. Um, one through the works, which you can see on the left hand side, um, which is the Shakespeare text and its related commentary. Um, and then the worlds on the right hand side, which is a reference content um, and which is also served up on the play and poetry home pages. Um, and looking through um, the, the pathway of the worlds, users could look by topic, so early modern theatres, medicine, exploration, Shakespeare in Bollywood, et cetera, et cetera, um, which would then lead the users back to the text um, that they wanted to consult. Um, so this is a landing page um, of Hamlet. We have a landing page for each of the plays and also for um, the poetry. Um, so we'd established what the two ends of the spectrum would be in the digital product. On the one hand, we'd have um, reliable, heavily annotated texts, and the, on the other, we'd have really detailed context. Um, however, the, the span of the CUP Shakespeare audience um, is happily huge. It ranges from 17-year-olds um, right up to the most eminent professors in the field. Um, and we were aware that the less advanced sections of our audience might feel overwhelmed when facing such a, a vast array of scholarship. Um, so what we needed were accessible jumping off points for them. Um, so in 2012, we published Professor Emma Smith's The Cambridge Shakespeare Guide, um, and this provided a fantastic accessible material um, which in the digital edition, we've divided up play by play um, to give brief summaries of each work. Um, and it also provides an overview of performance and critical history. So we built pages dedicated to each play and on each one, students are gently directed towards the concise guide um, to the play in question before they get overwhelmed um, by, by the scale of content on offer. As you can see from this slide, the play also serves up related essays from um, the reference content of the worlds. Um, so that helps to give the user a, a foothold um, in the vast expanse. Um, and also we've got related resources at the bottom, um, which have, have been curated for us. Um, moving through, I'll, I'll give you a, a sense of uh, some of the challenges we faced um, and how, how we proceeded. Uh, so the, the strategic issue of how to integrate the content in the most effective way um, was mirrored in practical terms by the technical challenge of integrating old and new uh, content types and linking them all up in a user-friendly manner. Um, so the worlds of Shakespeare, while it's absolutely huge, um, was, was being created newly from scratch. Um, and so from the outset, uh, even while thinking of our print edition, we were also thinking of how it would integrate into the digital edition from the start. So as such, it was relatively um, plain sailing in digital development terms. Um, the play texts were far less simple. So as with any digital edition, they had to contain more information um, more rigorously specified than texts for a print edition. Um, and they had to be coded consistently and completely enough to make them function effectively in the digital space. Um, if, 
you look at any any page of um, Shakespearean play text, um, you'll see that the typographic complexity of the text is enormous. Um, and this added further hurdles for us to clear. So you have um, the presence of both verse and prose, line numbers, split lines between speakers, um, and stage directions, all of which needed to be embedded in several layers of annotation. Um, so all of that added up to the fact uh, that this was infinitely more complex to digitise than um, a standard textbook or a standard monograph. To give you some idea of that complexity, um, I'll just show you a, a section of dialogue from The Merchant of Venice. Um, so here we've got verse, prose, um, we've also got a speech embedded within the Prince of Morocco speech, uh, stage direction interspersed between the two speakers, uh, and of course, lineation at the side, as well as textual notes, performance notes, um, and commentary notes. Um, and I'll just quickly lift the curtain on that to show you what lies beneath. Um, that's the code underneath, which um, I think is, is fairly dizzying to behold. Um, added to that, the editions were created in, in various content formats over the years and conceived of as, as print editions. So a huge amount of work was needed to get the content consistent and correct. And the older textual editions required a great deal of, of cleanup and retagging. Um, so we had a, a lot of quality assurance QA and a lot of rework after that. Um, the second challenge that we faced was the wider context of Cambridge's digital development, um, which was was both a challenge, but also ultimately an opportunity for us. So at the point we started, um, we'd already decided to replace our existing platform um, of books and journals with Cambridge Core. Um, so the work for this was underway while the Shakespeare work was, being, was, um, was occurring, um, but the final for form and function of Cambridge Core was unknown. Um, and it was being driven by ongoing interaction with, um, with librarians, scholars and students across the world. Um, so it was, it was clear to us that as hugely important Shakespeare studies is, um, the needs of one discipline couldn't drive um, a, a global platform um, of books and journals, uh, couldn't be the sole driver of the functional requirements of that platform. Um, it was also clear that to be successful, the, sh the final Shakespeare product really needed to adhere to the, the basic UX provided by the new platform um, in order um, for the user and administrator experience not to be unnecessarily complicated. Um, so we didn't, we didn't want to give a custom but a, a siloed product to people, which would be potentially difficult to support and difficult to use. Um, and really running counter to the unifying drive that Cambridge Core was leading. Um, all of this meant that the development work on the Shakespeare platform was effectively on hold until the Cambridge Core platform was complete. Um, so that the scale of the endeavour has been huge, um, but it's a real delight to see, to see the final product um, ready to go. So I'll give you, I'm conscious of the time, but give you a, a whistle stop tour of the platform. Um, if you'd like to find out more and have, have a look at a, a less of a breakneck speed, um, then do, do get in touch. Um, we've got the, the details there, the URL um, and the emails. So um, here's the homepage. So we've got the, the works and the plays and the world, the reference content. Um, you should also note that we've got a video introduction here to the site itself, um, which is really handy purposes. Um, quickly show you a landing page for playing in a, a little more detail than before. Um, so here we have Emma Smith's concise guide to the play. Um, we have the texts of the play here um, and then we have related content from the reference resource um, and we have related resources from uh, the Folger Shakespeare as well. Um, but as a, as a student, you can imagine that the first thing you want to do in your uh, essay crisis is quickly turn to Emma Smith's guide. So we'll just have a quick look at that. This is five pages distilling the key points a student needs to know. There's David Tennant looking a little bit alarming. Um, and it's written by Emma Smith, who's based at Hartford College, Oxford, 
general editor of Shakespeare Survey and one of the most well-known, most authoritative Shakespeare scholars in the world. So she goes through the plot, the characters, the concepts, the performances and the themes. Um, then uh, for more dedicated undergraduates and graduates, quickly show you um, a really detailed New Cambridge Shakespeare introduction to the play, um, broken into clear and accessible inviting sections. It's also important to note um, that as we, as we update the print editions, those updated editions are, are put up on the site. So um, this is actually the latest of our editions, um, edited by Heather Hirschfeld and published um, just this year. Um, and then we'll get into an actual play text um, to show you the, the different notes that we offer. Um, so immediately on, on Act 1, Scene 1, um, we've got a commentary note on uh, the line, stand and unfold yourself. Um, so giving a, a clear gloss to students who won't automatically be able to understand what that's about. Um, and then uh, we can show you a performance note. So on Bernardo's first line, um, you've got a sense of, of how that might actually be delivered and, and staged um, in performance. Um, and that's a, that's a huge help for, for literature lectures in particular. Um, just show you the Shakespeare in production introductions, so as well as the NCS introduction, we've got um, stage histories of um, of the plays as well. So this gives it a summary of the stage um, history, which faculty members often really love, um, as well as their students. But sadly, in the print, um, the editions were often, often priced too high for individual student use due to large production costs involved. Um, so this allows us to serve it up to students. Um, and then thirdly, we'll show you the um, textual notes so back in Hamlet, um, <coughs> text note um, in, in, yeah, um, gives you a sense of, of what's in the folio, what's in quarto two, and, and the editorial decisions that have been informing um, the text itself. Um, and then I'll just give you a, a quick sense of the level of integration and hyperlinking that the platform offers. Um, so you can see that in, within the commentary notes, um, different scenes are, are often referenced. Um, so, that's the one. Um, so this is actually in Merchant of Venice now. Um, and at uh, Act 1, Scene 178, um, we have a commentary note that, uh, 78, um, that references as you like it. So um, there's a comparative point being made um, and that is hyperlinked to the actual play text of as you like it itself. Um, so students wondering what's happening in that part of the play can follow it through themselves without Um, which is incredibly helpful. Um, um, and then also to point out that the, the line numbers correspond um, to the line numbers in the print edition itself. So um, lecturers can, can use the print in class as well as having the digital edition up on the screen. Um, and then for seven of the plays, we also have the early quartos. Um, so these are, these are really indispensable to textual scholars and advanced students. So um, the Hamlet one is, is there. Um, and then we quickly show you some of the world's content. So we've got relevant essays served up here. Um, and for example, the iconic characters, Ophelia, um, is a really concise, authoritative essay and a, a trustworthy time saver for students. Um, and then uh, just going back to the, the Hamlet landing page, um, you can see here we've got the, the audio material um, as well as various image um, based 
materials from the Folger Shakespeare Library's collection across the site. Um, some of my uh, favourite things include um, an interview with Stephen Greenblatt. Um, there's also stage designs by Salvador Dali. There's a clip from a silent film of Romeo and Juliet from the 1920s. Um, and there's a fantastic seminar on Shakespeare and religion. Um, so we hope that that will be really appealing to, um, to lecturers as they, they think about teaching tools um, to get their students interested in thinking about the context of the works. Um, we'll now go into to the worlds as uh, the final demo. Um, so we've seen the, the broad pathway offered by the works. Um, the worlds shows, uh, we can show here the experience that a user kind of has as if they work the other way around, so if they're working from context to text. Um, and we've, we've got a vast array of sections here, um, Shakespeare in production history, Shakespeare in the book, Shakespeare in the visual arts, etc. And then within those sections, we've got um, bite-sized chunks, uh, which go into to more detail. Um, and then again, the, the hyperlinking um, was really important to us here. Um, so to give you an example, we've got a whole section on religion in Shakespeare's world. Um, and that introductory essay could be very usefully assigned at undergraduate level. Um, but if readers want to go into greater depth, um, they can go into this component part. So we've got Shakespeare and Islam here. Um, every reference to the plays within the reference content has been carefully marked up um, so that the reader can move from the context to the text. Um, so, for example, this essay at, at one point considers how Othello's speech as he commits suicide um, taps into themes of race and religion. So at this point, the user can consult the speech in full by clicking on the hyperlinked reference um, and then derive further in interpretation for that speech um, from the NCS commentary notes and the production notes. Um, well, that was, that was quite a, a fast tour, um, but I hope it gives you some sense of um, how our content has been enriched by the digital platform, um, offering different routes through and, and ways to think about our resources in, in really a more integrated and joined up way. Um, and as uh, we mentioned, please do get in touch if, if you'd like more information. Um, and yeah, we'll be delighted to answer any questions that you have now as well. Thank you very, very much. Uh, this is Leah again coming back. Uh, before we get into our audience Q&A, I have a few poll questions, um, some questions that we would like our audience to answer. So I'm going to throw those up now. So um, attendees, if you could let us know if you're a college librarian or an other librarian or instructor, um, if you have any subject specialist uh, uh, special areas, um, or if you use any of the following uh, products, we'd be very interested. Uh, so please take a few moments to just click and answer uh, those questions there. We have some coming in. Um, so while that's coming in, um, also think about questions you have for our presenters. You can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit those questions for Emily and Rachel. Um, and I'll leave that up. So, so far, let's see here. I'll, I'll put the poll results up when it's, in, when it's ending, but we looks, looks like we've got about 33% college librarian, now it's up to 50%. 25% um, literature specialist, 25% drama, 50% other. For those other things, if you could let us know in the attendee chat what your other areas of uh, specialty are. Um, and same thing for the other products, you've 25% uh, drama online, 25% Norton, 50% other. Um, take a moment in the attendee chat to let us know. We're just curious uh, if you could know um, what those other things are, the other answers. Um, Let's see here, internal, let's see here. And if that's, um, so other, any answers for that, that would be good. And I'm just gonna leave this open another moment here. It looks like things are slowing down a bit. Um, okay, well, here we go. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the poll and we'll open it up for the Q&A. Let's see, there's the results so everybody can see. 
Um, so Q&A, if you would um, use the Q&A button to uh, submit your questions for our presenters. Um, Rachel and Emily, um, let's see here, we'll get started with the first one here. What is your favorite Shakespeare adaptation? Do you have a favorite film or other adaptation that you'd like to share with us? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky question. Um, I'm not sure this is my absolute favorite of all time, but it's certainly one of the first adaptations I, I came across um, when I was as much younger was um, Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. Film, which uh, at the time when I watched it, I had I had no sense of um, how Shakespeare could be adapted. So mm. um, I, I yeah was is incredibly naive in terms of knowing what what could be done um, in different formats and, and different contexts. Um, and yeah, I it, I just remember it, it blowing me away. Um, found it so exciting to see uh, how how Shakespeare could be transposed. Um, meaningfully and uh, not in an, a kind of embarrassing way uh, to, to a modern day context. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one, it's still one of my favorites. Great, thank I think you. I have, a, I have a kind of similar answer to be honest. I'm also a big fan of uh, literature from different periods being effectively transposed. So uh, my one, at least one of my favorite Shakespeare adaptations is 10 Things I Hate About You. Absolutely. Um, which really cleverly, I think, merges Shakespeare with the kind of classic American teen movie genre. So, mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, another one. How does this platform compare to others that are focused on Shakespeare or drama? Um, yeah, so I think uh, one, of, one of the main things that we offer, which is distinct from others, is, is really the range of the contextual material. So, um, our platforms serve up the texts, but uh, don't have the range of reference content um, that, that we're offering. Um, and secondly, we, we offer a much more integrated experience. So um, some of the platforms out there, you've got great content there, but it's not necessarily linked up um, in a kind of careful um, and, and thoughtful way, which is something that we've tried really hard to do with um, with the hyperlinking um, and yeah, the, the pathways that we've created for users. Thank you. To, Thank you. to add to that, I think a, a crucial uh, and easily missed kind of benefit of this new platform is that it doesn't just include Shakespeare's plays, it also includes all of his poetry. So the complete sonnet series and all the longer narrative poems. Um, and the reason that's important is because a lot of other platforms are focused exclusively on plays and drama, uh, where it just wouldn't make as much sense to include poetry as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, a question that I have actually, um, some of the, the background information you gave on the timeline of the, the amount of time, the years that it took um, for the print editions to be compiled and put together, and then to look at the immense amount of material that's available online now and uh, the linking, the, as you mentioned, like how, how long did it take approximately to put all that together and make it available online? Um, so uh, the, the thinking behind the digital platform really, really kicked off in a serious way in 2010. Um, so that was when, um, when we first, when, when the works had been commissioned. Um, and at that point, the two um, general editors of the works, they applied um, for grant fundings, which um, made it possible uh, for, for us to have a really wonderful workshop um, in California um, with a large, large number of scholars and librarians represented. And, and that was um, uh, so one, of, one of the first scenes of um, us kind of thrashing out ideas and finding out um, what, what would be useful and desirable to people. Um, and, and there was a lot of other, other kind of pockets of market research along the way, but that was really the starting point. Um, and then uh, because the, the development of the platform was, was put on hold, um, it, from that point, it, it was a, a delayed delivery. So um, I think if, if we had that, delay then it, it would have come out sooner but at the same time the work itself was incredibly um time intensive so yeah nine years from um <laughs> first thinking about it to deliver that's amazing it. yeah well thank you any other questions from the audience 
or Rachel, Emily, anything that you uh, that we haven't covered that we haven't asked that you would like to cover now? I don't think so. I guess I'd just like to thank everybody for listening. Um, please do feel free to get in touch um, at the addresses we've got on the screen. So that's online at cambridge.org if you are in the US or the rest of the Americas. And if anybody happens to have called in from elsewhere, then library.sales at cambridge.org. Um, also, feel free to visit the website and have a bit of an explore yourself. We do have some free content that is linked from the homepage just to give you a bit of a taste, um, a bit more than you've had this afternoon. Great. Well, thank you, Emily and Rachel. Uh, thank you to, Ox uh, to Cambridge University Press for sponsoring today's session. Thank you to our attendees for being here. Um, there's going to be a short survey after the webinar closes. Uh, if you just take a few moments, uh, three questions, just let us know uh, how, about today's session and maybe suggestions for future topics or speakers or any other comments that you have. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, the session is being recorded. We'll make it available on the conference website within the next couple of days, and we'll email everyone who registered with a link once that's available. Um, so once again, thanks everyone for being here. If there are no further questions or comments, we will call it a wrap, and I will see you at the next Charleston Conference webinar. Thanks, and have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.